Welcome to Synthaholics. This is your sick co-host, David Duncan, and with me is the Countess, incredible... Countess, Countess, Aaron O'Brien. Countess. Are you sure it's not, uh, it's not, uh, Countess, what's a pussy? <laughs> Regina? Regina, not what's a pussy, I'm sorry. No, it's Countess Aaron O'Brien. Countess mm. Aaron O'Brien. Mm-hmm. Well, so, hello, Yes, hello everyone. If I sound strange and weird, it is because I am ill this week. Me and Aaron are not in the same room, so I do not get him ill. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> we, I usually we, hand, I usually handle his drinks that I make, and I'm like, I probably shouldn't be doing that if you know I don't want to get him sick. Yeah, unfortunately, I've been kind of under the weather too, but I'm feeling okay. You sound I've good. Been, I've been yeah, I've been muscling through, but it's uh same same kind of thing, just not as severe as you. Mr. Basie. <laughs> Count Basie. Count Basie. <laughs> so, right. Ca- Countess. Countess Basie sounds very good, nah. Yeah. So hey, uh this episode we are talking about a special two parter, uh elementary dear data episode and ship in a bottle. Uh, Elementary uh, Dear Data takes place in Season 2, Episode 3, which uh, aired December 5th, 1988. And then uh, Ship in the Bottle, uh, Next Generation episode, happens Season 6, Episode 12, and that aired January 25th, 1993. Um, We're doing it back-to-back because we have the awesome holograph character, uh, Professor Moriarty. Professor Moriarty and uh, James Moriarty. If you remember way, way back, if you're one of those original listeners, we said we do a holograms gone wild, and we can dub this a holograms gone wild, doing two it, hologram ep- episodes in one. Yeah, um, but this one was really special, I thought, because um, we got to focus on a character, and uh, I think there's, I mean, I, I distinctly remember after watching this episode, especially the last one, Ship in the Bottle, I felt that there was huge, all these huge moral dilemmas with this. And I, I and the way they left it, I kind of felt like uh, they didn't ever resolved it. And then and then when we get Voyager, we get the doctor. I wonder what happened to James Moriarty after that. Well, I read somewhere or heard on another podcast that somehow there was a pitch to get Moriarty on Voyager. Now that would be sweet. And the reason it didn't go from what I heard, read, or I can't remember where it was. I, I don't remember my source, but I, I remember reading this or hearing this somewhere. That the idea was that uh, Deep Space, a Quark somehow acquired, or someone, someone in Deep Space Nine acquired that cube that had like the Moriarty program going going down, and you know somehow got smuggled aboard Voyager um, while Voyager was stationed at Deep Space Nine before they went out. And got stuck in the Delta Quadrant. And then, you know, they'd of course have a holodeck episode where, you know, Moriarty comes up and causes problems and there's a whole new people. Like they're, and then they have to deal with, you know, it's like, oh, crap. <laughs> and right. the Delta Quadrant. And then we have, oh, and especially if it came up, like, you know, later in season four with the Doctor, like, maybe he'd try to hijack the Doctor's, holo- you know, mobile emitter. I mean, there'd be so much crazy stuff. And the reason it didn't happen is because, from what I remember, is that... Um, the the Voyager staff and the Deep Space Nine staff like didn't get along, mm. like there was mm-hmm. like a rivalry or something going on, and That's so be, because of that, it never made it into um, never made it into it. Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, I, I knew, I knew, I mean, there is uh, is some sort of rivalry there because uh, Ronald D. Moore was only associated with Voyager for a very short stint. And I heard things uh, that went down, you know, that people were threatened to be fired if anyone ever sided with Ronald D. Moore on anything. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I'm just like, 
So, like, again, you know, Ronald D. Moore had a really short stint on Voyager, and then he went on to do Battlestar Galactica, which was great until season three. Right, yeah. Yeah, but still, I mean... But say, I mean, what, something went on between them. I don't know exactly what it is. Uh, there's a Deep Space Nine documentary coming out that was kickstarted a couple months ago, or, or Indiegogo a couple months ago. So maybe that'll shed light onto it. Maybe that'll be, be touched onto. I have, I have no idea. But it'd be interesting to hear if there, if there was anything like that officially from the people. Right. Um, yeah, it just would have been cool to see if any, anything like that would have been attempted at some point. Just so the, Just the guy, the actor who plays Moriarty in these episodes, like he is my favorite Moriarty on, he's my favorite on-screen Moriarty ever. And he wasn't even in a, you know, a pure Sherlock Holmes thing. Right. He just yeah. plays Moriarty so good. He's such a good actor and he's got the look and no one else I've seen play Moriarty like is, it's not the same. Well, you know, everyone's got their own take, of course. Sure, but, sure. Uh, but like I, this guy was like born to play Moriarty. Right. Yeah. I I, I enjoyed his I enjoyed his take on Moriarty and I, I enjoyed both star stories. I, I uh, admittedly, Ship in the Bottle is a far stronger episode, but uh, Elementary, uh, My Dear Data, it definitely sets everything up. So Yeah, yeah it does. Well, um, Elementary, My Dear Data, got a, uh, the, the director was really pissed because he got screwed over. Like, I think they cut a day in the memory office that they cut a day off shooting, which made the shoot miserable. He was scared that ruined, that was going to ruin the episode. Hmm. So, I mean, if they had that extra day of shooting, maybe it would have been a little bit better. Yeah, it probably would have been. But uh, it's just, I just, it was interesting reading the the time constraints on him, and they built this the, that whole London set was like you know soundstage set built from the ground up for for this episode. That's a huge set for just a single episode. It's pretty pretty. Yeah, cool. absolutely, absolutely. And all the detail in it too is absolutely gorgeous set. Right. Um, I checked over news for uh, anything with Discovery or anything else, and I hadn't seen anything really noteworthy to talk about. Um, the one thing I did want to just bring up that I did see that I know I posted onto our site, uh, for the, but was the, uh, Star Trek RPG, uh, Borg's Q box. Oh, yeah. Is that, is that, uh, a, is that a brand new game or are they just repackaging it? I don't ever remember seeing this game before. So, uh, this is brand new. So this is totally, I, I don't know how well it, you know, plays, uh, but it just looks wonderful. And I think it's, uh, set in the next generation era so oh, that sounds cool yeah just it's just it's a role-playing game for the star trek uh it's from uh, uh Mo, modifus modifus star trek adventures and it comes in a big board cube i think that so. i think that's like just the best box for it. a big board, <laughs> a board, big board cube i think that's awesome um i love star trek Catan also it's a it's really fun yeah well, I, I used to play when I was younger the uh, Star Trek FASA um, role playing game, but at the besides the ship to ship battle, the uh, character um, generation stuff was a little clunky. So, mm -hmm. but uh, this looks pretty cool. So um, definitely check that out if you get a chance. I uh, I, I think I'd like to order that and see if uh, we could ever Dude, get a game. We going. should we should we should do a game and like podcast it. Maybe, we should maybe get Robbie or Josiah or somebody, you know, get a couple of people together and just do that for like an episode. It would be, be wonderful. Kind of, that'd be kind of fun. Yeah, I would love to do that just to have some fun with it. Robbie, Josiah, you're signed up. <laughs> right. Um, I guess they they don't have a choice. I, I hope they don't. <laughs> Hopefully they'll willingly participate. Right. So should we get started with our uh, episode breakdowns? Are you excited? All right, so I'll do a little briefer than uh, normal, just to because we're doing two episodes. I said eyesore. No, eyesore. I have an eyesore in my vagina. In my vagina. So my neck uh, looks like a vagina. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> Is that a Trump joke? No, that's uh, that's um, fat bastard joke from Austin Powers. Oh, they Trump. Uh, so it's when it's at the end of the second or third one. He like fat bastard lost all his weight. And he's like, oh, my neck looks like a vagina. Oh Jesus! I and, forgot about that. <laughs> um. <laughs> anyways, moving forward. Uh, so the Enter Enterprise is going to be meeting up with the uh, Cap. I mean, sort of the HMS Victory. Why is it the HMS Victory? Oh no, it's not the HMS. It's just the Vic USS Victory. But uh. Jordy served under Captain Zimbata as an ensign, and so he constructs a uh, HMS Victory uh, sailing ship. 
in engineering, not in his quarters, not, you know, in like, you know, the rec room, in engineering. Let's hope the ship doesn't get any bumps along the way like they often do. Oh, yeah, that. And, you know, like, people are trying to work. Like, I, I can't, like, I, everyone must have been so pissed at him. He's, like, sitting there, like, trying to build this intricate ship in the middle of engineering. Like, I just, I. I he's got, like, he's got, like, band saws yeah. and he's sanding pieces <laughs> down. And he's got then he's lacquer like, everywhere. I know he's lacquering and gluing and people are like, dude, that like, smell is, like, really strong. <laughs> And I just, I just love how like uh, like the captain's log was like yeah we're here three days early we have nothing to do like this could have been like a multi part episode of like all, what's all the chaos that happens on the Enterprise like when they're waiting around for three days and there's nothing to do it would be great like because this one kind of focuses mostly on you know uh, you know Pulaski Data and Geordi you know what about what about Riker what about his crazy adventures so is he like chasing Troy over the ship who knows he we could get been. to see that fun stuff. Yeah, we should have seen more of that. But well, maybe Riker was just uh, playing his uh, trombone. Uh, maybe. Serenading well, Troy. <laughs> so uh, uh, after Jordy shows... <laughs> after after Data... I mean, after Jordy shows Data's uh, ship that he's made, he says, but we're going to do something else. We're going to do a Sherlock Holmes adventure on the holodeck. So... Uh, they rush over to the holodeck. They get into their clothes, and uh, there should have been like a montage for this, like an '80s montage. That would have been uh, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> them getting dressed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although they probably had to paint data in places other than his face, neck, and hands. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. <clears throat> well, anyways, no time for that. So, no time for that. Uh, so they uh, they enter into the holodeck. And Data, unfortunately, he just kind of blows through all the answers to all the um, uh, mysteries that are presented in front of him because Data has memorized all the Sherlock Holmes adventures and stories. So there's nothing that's going to surprise Data. So when Jordy asks for a Sherlock Holmes adventure, unfortunately, um, they just it, it pulls up one of their stories and Data just figures it out right away. And then Jordy storms off. Like, he doesn't even explain what he's doing. And, like, Data's, like, chasing him through the ship. I'm like, wouldn't you have just, like, explained it then instead of waiting to go to 10 forward to explain it? Right, right. It just, so, it just seems kind of a strange leap. But I guess you, you had to have the conversation in front of Pulaski so she could, you know, be a dick to Data. Yeah, so uh, in 10 forward, while they're still in their Victorian garb, uh, they're talking. Jordy's explaining to Data why you can't just – it's no fun just to blow through – the whole mystery without going through the at least the motions of it, even though you know all the answers to it. So that's when uh, Dr. Pulaski says to Jordy, well, he can't. He's just a computer. He's not going to make any leaps uh, to figure out the mystery. So, But then, you know, J Jordy does point out that deductive reasoning is one of Data's stronger uh, suits. Yeah, like so he, he does have the ability. It's just that since he knows everything, he's just going to, you know, go to the end. So... Pulaski's just being kind of an ass. I don't like Pulaski. This is, like, why I don't like Pulaski, pretty much. Like, just her, every time she sees Data, she talks down to him and says horrible things to him. Don't yeah, like she, does kinda, of she, she does kind of shit on him a lot. Like, if uh, she didn't do that, I might not be so hard on her, but I'm just like, Data's, like, one of my favorite TNG characters, so I'm like, oh, you can't do that to Data. And it's not like it's not like the bones. It's not like the bone Spock thing, because like you know, you know, bones really like Spock. I mean, it's just it's, it's they just kind of do it to get on each other's nerves. Right. But Data can't experience getting on nerves, so it's just mean. It just comes off as like he can't perceive it. I mean, Spock perceives it, but per perce you know wants to ignore it because that's his prerogative. Data can't even perceive it because that's how he's programmed. So it's, it doesn't come off the same as a bone Spock thing. Right, and it's sort of like um, when you watch these uh, robots uh, that are like they're working on and they're kicking them over and stuff like that. Oh yeah, the, the, the how, Boston Institute how, robots. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of how I feel about it. <laughs> yeah, but those people are related to the Dr. Pulaski. Just kick yeah. them over, a robot. And, make them make them drop their box they're holding. Man, and them and their children will be the first to die in the uh, robot <laughs> in the uh, robot revolution. Robot. I, I seriously feel. I mean, like it's crazy to feel bad for these weird ass looking robots, but it does. It's like it's kind of it is kind of mean. It is a little mean, but <laughs> moving on. Uh, 
Jordy decides that he's uh, when they uh, they invite Doctor Pulaski and say maybe we make a like a mesh up or do something different for a mystery that Data would have to figure out that uh, this would be a test of Data's deductive powers and uh, you know they invite Pulaski to come and she accepts and they head down to the holodeck and here's where Jordy makes his big faux pas he tells the computer. Uh, make a uh, enemy or a character capable of defeating data. So uh, I love how it cuts to the bridge for a second, and Worf's like, "Oh, I saw this this huge power surge. It's gone yeah, now. It's fine. It's gone now. Oh my god! Somebody really <laughs> flushed the toilet. It's plugging up all our sewer systems. Must have been Worf's toilet. All that prune yeah. juice. <laughs> exactly. Oh, Pulaski <laughs> just uh, used the toilet. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> So anyways, uh, while they're going through the program and the adventures, uh, Dr. Pulaski is kidnapped and uh, they're trying to search her down and they find uh, Professor James Moriarty as the uh, person who's kidnapped her, her abductor, and that's when they confront her and confront him. Um, So uh, he's like in some back factory section and he uh, is – trying to obviously run some kind of plot against uh, Sherlock Holmes. But he he realizes that something's off because Professor Moriarty at one point sees uh, Data and Geordi call, the up the, call up the arch. But the thing is, he notices this before he's been given his super cognitive ability, which is really bizarre because you, you see him, they cut to him specifically watching them because he's watching Sherlock Holmes. But then he sees the arch when they call for it, and then that's when they make the program super hard. Right. I don't understand how he saw it before that. I don't know. I kind of thought he saw it after that, but, I mean, I'll take your word for it. I mean, he, I'm sure he did see it after, but he was, he was following them. Uh, I mean, it was, it was, he saw the entire sequence. He saw it going up to it, saw them asking the question, and then he went up to it after it was done. So it was kind of the, the whole sequence, really, he was watching. And his girlfriend, which was not uh, Regina Burke. Not Regina. Okay. She was uh, a prostitute named Vagina. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm sorry. <laughs> Pussy galore. I'm sorry. No, it's Vagina. Vagina with a B. With a B. <laughs> <laughs> or, or no, no, Fajita. A Fajita. It's like a you, you know, fajita. You gotta, you gotta earn that R. <laughs> okay. <laughs> R is for regal. <laughs> And restricted. <laughs> Anyways, that's so, true. <laughs> so, uh, but us for banana. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, that's what she does when she's not with men. <laughs> oh man, Moriarty, what are you doing? What are you doing to yourself? <laughs> Anyways, Getting so crabs. She, she, she sees uh, she sees it as well as uh, Moriarty, and she goes, "I don't know what it is, but I'm getting out of here. I'm getting so, out of here." Some kind of black magic it is. Oh, that was so great. She's missing teeth and she's like, all right, I don't, I, she can barely speak eloquently at all. That's awesome. I know. I know. She's, they're like, it, I mean, like you can tell so many. She's like, like the London equivalent of white trash. <laughs> oh yeah. She's, she hangs out with Whitechapel with the, with the, uh, the Jack the Ripper. So. <laughs> Too bad it wasn't her dead. Like later, cause later just some random guys dead on the street. It would be funny if it was her. So they had like a Jack the Ripper type thing going on. Oh, that would have been cool. That would have been really cool. Instead of just a random dead guy who was like just released in prison, that'd be cool. Like tying a little bit of Jack the Ripper stuff in there. Because I mean, I think I think part of Sherlock Holmes was kind of like written around that time and kind of like oh yeah yeah uh, intertwined yeah. with that mythology a little bit in fiction. Yeah, it's too bad we didn't get that. But so um, so Moriarty uh, goes to the arch and he starts getting information. Uh, obviously, later on, like I said, he uh, abducts. Uh, uh, Pulaski, and from there they ha- when they track him down, he pulls up the arch again and says, "What the hell is this?" And they're like, "How can you do that?" So he hands he hands Data a piece of paper. Mm-hmm. Remember, this is holographic paper because this is important. <laughs> in about two seconds, when Data storms off the holodeck <laughs> with holographic paper in tow. <laughs> And then shows Jordy the picture of the holographic paper inside the hallways, which is outside of the holodeck. Which should not exist. <laughs> nope. 
but somehow it does. But it's nope. a picture of it's a it's a drawing of the Enterprise. And he's like, "What is this?" So I love how he shows it to Data upside down. I mean, he shows it to Jordy upside down. So when Jordy has it, flips it to the screen. It's right side up. And doesn't Jordy's visor can't just see through the paper anyways? Yeah, like, I, can't I don't see I don't, the lead on it. I don't understand how Jordy's visor works because it seems like it's like like uh, Terminator vision or like the Predator vision. Where he can like change the spectrum and like he can see like microscopic cracks in walls. How does he see like consoles to press buttons? It seems like his vision wouldn't be able to pick that up. No, I think he can see the whole spectrum. So, but he can like regulate the spectrum what he can see. Oh, well, so just I, I mean, in the one episode, I think it's season one where like they beam over to that ship and like and they they plug. It's the one they get. They use the plug in that shows Jordy's visor on the view screen, and yeah. it's like red and black garbage. As he can't see anything. Like, this is how you see Jordy. How do you see anything? Yeah, Picard's watching. Goes, Jordy. I can't see anything. It's just a bunch of red and black garbage <laughs> anywhere. That's that's Riker. <laughs> is that the scrambled porn channel? <laughs> no, that's Riker. <laughs> it looks like a, he's got the porn stash and everything. Like back in the turn up channel to a hundred on Basic, and you get that scrambled. <laughs> this, yeah, I, I, I'm well aware of oh, the scrambled yeah. porn. Channel. That was a good channel. <laughs> <laughs> looking for a boob. Just um, looking, searching for a boob. Searching for what boob? Uh, and all I got was a regina. No. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> uh, so they bring this attention to um, uh, to Captain Picard. Uh, oh, but uh, Moriarty takes over the ship, or he starts doing weird things to the ship, he like shakes having, the ship. Like, hey, let's shake this ship up. He built this giant steampunk thing with a lever on it, and it just like changes the the attitude of the ship left and right. Makes no sense whatsoever how he would do that. <laughs> Makes no sense at all. He built some random contraption. It just, I don't know. It's it's. I guess it's the only way he could figure out how to make a computer interface for the uh, since he doesn't have computer parts in his hologram program. Right. So uh, from there, uh, Picard decides he just goes down and talk to uh, <laughs> Professor Moriarty. I love this. Picard's like, oh, I'm going to get dressed up. I don't want him to ask questions about my uniform. Worf also gets dressed up. And I really wish there was an 80s montage for Worf getting dressed up because Worf getting dressed up goes nowhere because he doesn't even go on the holodeck. As long as at some point when he puts on his pants, he splits his uh, the britches of his pants because he's like, oh. His butt's ridged and, you know, pants aren't made. They didn't his, make... his butts are ridged. <laughs> he's Anyways. ridged all the way down. You've seen, you've seen his back, right? He's got all these ridges going down his back. I mean, yeah, his, yeah, his, got... his ass must be ridged too, right? <laughs> ridged for, for his and her pleasure. His and her pleasure. Anyways, so... Uh, he goes down there and he confronts Moriarty and basically saying, you know, I realize that you understand you are a a hologram on the holodeck. And he's saying, but I am conscious. I know. And he says the, the line, I think therefore I am to argue that he's alive. Um, you know, Picard's, uh, obviously, recognizes that he's sentient but he says we just don't have it's not possible with our technology to let you just run free so what we'll do is we'll freeze this program it won't seem like anything and by the next time you're come back uh come back um we'll have it all figured out and uh he says goodbye to pulaski he promises to fill it with full of crumpets. crumpets i'm like that's some weird sexual indian though yeah because you know moriarty and her, she, they, they had to have done it because, like, when Picard comes in the room, she's all sitting up and she's all disheveled. Like, mm-hmm. like I'm pretty sure they they were passing the time while they were waiting for you know Sherlock to come back. Yeah, it's Victorian times. There's nothing to do. <laughs> nope. It's boring. Anyway, so and the U.S. <laughs> uh, the USS Victory a ra- a rendezvous with the Enterprise and all is well. Well, now we're going to for- fast forward to season six. Couple- Season six, four years later. What's um, interesting, though, um, on Elementary, My Dear Data, is in the Memory Alpha uh, that there's a different ending. Originally, the ending was Picard knew that he could walk off the holodeck because the paper with the Enterprise was able to come off the uh, holodeck. So, like, the the safety routines or something like that had let that happen because it was the holodeck was so jacked up. So he knew he could walk off, but he just deceived him. And to say, hey, look, we have to, you have to do this whole thing. But so they cut that part out. 
But this still doesn't make any sense. They could walk off. It doesn't. I think you know. But the reason they cut it was because they didn't want to make Picard look more of like a dick. Yeah, they didn't want to look, make him look deceitful. Mm. So that's why they cut it. They didn't cut it because of the because of the techno stuff. But I mean, gotcha, gotcha. Well, uh, so when we get to ship in the bottle, uh, we have Data and Jordy doing the Sherlock Holmes mystery again, and uh, they're you know you catch them right in the middle of their you know he's. Uh, unpacking a whole mystery, uh, Data's figuring it all out. Uh, when he goes to throw something at the uh, one of the guys that he thinks should be uh, left-handed, but he unfortunately catches with his right hand, and Data's like, "Oh, that's strange. There must be something wrong with the holodeck program." And uh, they call up uh, Barclay. Hey, Barclay, to- can you fix this? Yeah, can you come fix it up? Can you come just- why? Why is he allowed to fix the holodecks when when they're they're all so concerned of his like, you know video game holodeck addiction? I know it's like having it's just like, like- <laughs> someone with a gambling addiction and then sending him to like fix the uh, slot machines in a gambling place. Like, yeah, can it, you fix these. It just it just uh, seems. It yeah, seems- I can uh, fix some of these. Uh, can so- I have a couple chips to put in? <laughs> Especially after he had like you know Deanna Troy dressed up as Aphrodite, like you know sex god. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And his like program, and everyone else, and all these weird things. Like, why would they let him near the holodeck? I don't know. So as Barclay goes through the programming, he, he sees that there is a issue with a glitch in one of their matrix diodes, and uh, he runs the program, and who pops up is Professor James Moriarty, and. Moriarty basically says, "Where's Captain Picard? I want to see him." And Barclay's like, "How? Oh, you know, he does- that's weird. You know people. That's weird." And, and then he realizes that uh, Moriarty knows that he is, you know, a uh, hologram within you know the holodeck. So he says, "I you, I have to talk to uh, Captain Picard. Bring him to me." So Barclay goes to uh, Data and Jordy and says, you know what I just ran into? <laughs> I, just, I just ran into uh, James Moriarty. And they're, and look on their faces. We're like, oh, my God. Well, the, it was interesting because, like, he, he pulls the plug. He's like, well, I've got to, I've still got to finish my work here. So he pulls the plug and he pretends to disappear, but he doesn't. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. Because he reappears right after Barclay leaves. And it's like, uh-oh. Bad, right. bad things are about to happen. Well, I got I got a lot of issues with this, but I and I want to come back to this later. But, um, but anywho, so uh, during this time, the uh, the Enterprise is going to watch two gas giants collide, and it's going to form a new star. So they're really close to this to watch the observe it, but then they're going to back off if it gets uh, it, when it gets too crazy with the star forming. Uh, <laughs> That's just sort of the background kind of thing going on. Well, the thing is, like, one looks like a gas giant. The other one looks like a sun already. I'm like, that's, that's doesn't look like a gas giant. It looks like a sun. Okay, but cool. I didn't have a problem with it. It, so, it. it looked cool, like them like starting to meld. I thought I thought it was like a a gas giant falling into a star. That's what it looked like to me. It was kind of cool seeing how they were going to start to stick together. One of the things that uh, Moore already told Barclay was that uh, he was aware at times of the passage of time. So he wasn't he, aware. He said he felt like it felt longer than four years. I'm like, that's weird. Right. So uh, when they come to Picard about this, Picard decides to go down to talk to Moriarty. And Moriarty was like, I thought you were going to get this fixed for me. We're going to have this all figured out. And Picard is like, well, you have been trying to work it out, but we just don't have the answers for you, unfortunately, yet. And he says, I did not know that you'd actually feel the passing of time during – you know, during being in the, you know, as stored in the holodeck programs. Things like that shouldn't happen. That's not scientifically, you're not getting any power. You shouldn't notice anything. Right. And that's uh, one of the issues that I have with this is it's, there's some weird stuff going on. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, Barkley does say like, you know, maybe there's some kind of glitch in the matrix that like, you know, you know, triggered some power going to your node or something that may have made you feel like there was some time. Right. Well, so uh, Moriarty says, again, uh, brings up the I think, therefore, I am. So he decides that he says, because I am aware, I should be able to walk out of this holodeck right now. And Picard's like, it's just not possible. And he throws a book through and it just disappears. And he goes, but I am not an inanimate, inanimate object. I am an actual person, a being. I should be able to. And Picard's like, once you walk through there, you will die. And but he walks through and he's fine. 
and he starts walking down the hallway. I love how this episode's like a mind trip. It is a mind trip, especially but, the, especially the first time you see it. Like I, I you know, I, I knew kind of what was going on because I've seen it a couple times, and I was like, okay, this is where the shenanigans start. Right, right. Shenanigans. I call shenanigans. And I would have been, if I was Picard, I would have been saying, I call shenanigans right now. Yeah, like, I, I, I'm i sort of surprised that he believed that at face value. Yeah, exactly, because there's no possible way. But from there, um, they go to the, um, they go to Dr. Crusher in sick bay. She checks him out because besides some unusualness in his DNA, he's perfectly fine. And uh, Moriarty says, I wish to go above deck and I want to see wh- what the ship's like. And so he brings them to 10 forward and he goes, we're on a starship. We're not on a ship ship. And uh, we're in Moriarty, space. We're in space. So Moriarty is obviously, you know, amazed by all this. But then he brings out up, of his element. He's out of his element. And he wants to catch up. He's, he's, he wants to learn so much about everything that's going on. But I can't but, learn anything without... Regina. Regina Bartholomew. Bartholomew. Countess, Countess Regina Bartholomew. Regina it's... Barf. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> well, just, that's, you know, bar, bar, from Spaceballs, Barf, his full name is Barf. Bartholomew. So I, Regina yeah, Barf. <laughs> that's, that's Countess to you. Countess Regina Barf, I'm sorry. Anyways, so uh, he says, I would really, I, I was programmed that she is my everything my uh, soulmates, you know, my love of my life. And I would really like to have her, you know, with me on this journey. And Picard's like, well, that's great, but I don't think we can bring her out right now because I don't think it's going to work. I don't think we can actually um, do the same thing that just happened. I don't, because we don't even understand how it happened. So um, Moriarty's a little, <laughs> a little like you, you are you going to just make me wait for another four years or however long it takes? Let's call more shenanigans because Moriarty knows he's not off the holodeck. I don't know. I mean, Moriarty's just uh, duping everybody yeah. right now. It's, it's 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 really smart though because I mean, like you know, if you're watching the episode the first time, you're like, what? Oh yeah, it doesn't make any sense. So um, uh, Picard basically says, "We'll get Regina soon, but just just." Let's be safe about it. Let's figure out what's going on. So they're in the observation. I mean, they're in uh, 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 conference room? the conference room. Thank you very much. And they're talking about the all the issues that's going on. And they all agree we should we should wait on this. We should wait. But unfortunately, all of a sudden, uh, the ship is no longer under control uh, at the bridge. It does like it does the you know the shake again. Mm-hmm. Just a shimmy shake. Like, and, oh, this was this happened four years ago when we saw uh, Moriarty. Hmm. He's really good at shaking the rocking the boat. Yeah, don't I do not don't. want him for a canoe partner. No, no. <laughs> <Wouldn't I? laughs> Worst so, canoe uh, partner ever. Moriarty shows up on the bridge and he goes, I've sorry, Captain, I, I want Regina. And Picard's like, We all want Regina, okay? Can we just please? Give me back my ship. Just give me back my ship. We don't want to. We don't want to die. He's like, oh, I'm just a, I'm just a fictional character. What have I got to lose? <laughs> right. Uh, and you know, Picard says, look, we're real close to these planets. We got to back away. And he goes, well, this would be a great time for you to try to figure out how to uh, beam my, uh, Regina off of the uh, off the holodeck because you know uh, deadlines are a wonderful motivator. Yeah. So he has uh, Picard and Data, Barclay, uh, and Jordy working on it and trying to figure this out. So they use this uh, – uh, fa- The, the uh, pattern pat- enhancers. The pattern enhancers to try to beam a chair out. And uh, this is where Data figures out that – Things are not, not what they seem. Which is weird because if you think about it, like why didn't the computer actually just like go through and just – maybe because it didn't have any information to give Data – but Moriarty must have figured out that he would have been getting a readout. So basically when the chair tried to beam through and didn't work, they were like, well. Let's check the logs. Uh, and let's check the logs. nothing and, there. And Data's reading the logs like there's nothing here. It says, well, something's going on. And then all of a sudden he realizes that all this is we are still in the holodeck. And then he throws and, some at Jordy and Jordy catches it with his left hand when he's right-handed. Mm-hmm. Right. And Picard's like, what, really? We've been in the holodeck the entire time? 
Yes. I didn't. I didn't see through this. I'm. I've outwitted <laughs> Q more than once. <laughs> but getting duped by a, a bunch of holograms. Oh. Right. He's like, well, so when I scored with Beverly last night, it wasn't real. Damn no, it. Damn, that's not true. Oh. Uh, so I've got some explaining to do. <laughs> I got some explaining to do. So um, he uh, so they uh, he goes to Picard goes to Regina in uh, talks her Tries about to make a deal with her. Says, look, um, we think we can get the Heisenberg compensators. Uh, if we do some, make some changes on it, we could actually, uh, we could actually beam you off. So Moriarty contacts, uh, Riker in the real world to say, if you do these things, you can get us off the, off the holodeck and we'll leave you alone forever. Right. And we'd like to have, uh, we'd like to, once they beam them off, supposedly beam them off the holodeck, they, uh, want a shuttlecraft. And they want to just fly away. He says, just leave us alone. We just want to fly away. I and want to get away. I, I want, want to fly, fly away. away. In a show yeah, yeah. So uh, they take off. At the same time, uh, the whole holodeck, um, uh, Picard and Data and Barclay is like, are like end program and then end program. And they are like uh, in a holodeck exception. Within a holodeck. So it's like Inception. And uh, Barclay pulls out like a uh, storage in, uh, piece out of the arch. It looks and then, really cool. It's like this weird layered cube. Yeah. And then he puts them in some machine and they basically say, hey, this um, uh, this machine can keep their adventures going without actually being a hologram and they can go on adventures for the rest of their lives for as long as they know. And then they, you know, laugh and like, Oh, you know, some people say, what if, what if our, you know, life is just some, you know, hologram or some simulations from someone's box on someone's desk. And yeah. then, then they all walk off and Barkley's still there. He's like, and end program. End program. End program. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. So uh, that was the uh, that was the uh, two episodes in a nutshell. I mean, both episodes are really worth watching. They're very fun. Um, but Dave, uh, after seeing both of them back to back, how did you? Th- what was your takeaway and feelings about these two episodes? I think these episodes are even more enjoyable watching them back to back as opposed to watching them over, you know, that four season gap. Yeah, because you could forget. Yeah, interestingly, that four year gap was because. Um, there was like some kind of like rights issue with uh, the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle uh, thing. Really? <coughs> that's why it took so long to make a sequel because there was some kind of like required, you know, licensing thing that they had to pay. Huh. And then when they just wanted to do it again. They approached him again. They, I guess they said it was some kind of misunderstanding that it's actually a really reasonable deal to get. Uh, and the rights to, you know, Sir, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's, you know, a licensing agreement to use these characters. So wow. at first they thought it was public domain because yeah. it had been such a long time, but it, it was still under, you know, copyright or something. So then they had to get permission for the second time. That's why it took so long, according to Memory Alpha. Right, right. Hmm. Interesting. Well, the thing with me is uh, I saw this and I kind of felt like uh, because they hadn't brought Mor- uh, Moriarty back, I kind of think it was kind of a dick move. You know, especially by Picard without actually addressing it. I mean, basically, and they, and they never, they never like did anything about it, and they didn't reference it ever. The episode, like you're like you're saying, it was like a dick move by Picard, and like it's almost like it used the original ending and not the ending that we got from Elementary, My Dear Data. Mm-hmm. But, it, but not just that; it's just I felt like sort of like um, you literally have a sentient being living inside your ship, and you know. I would think that that would be like a pretty important, like you'd have some top scientists working on that. Now, maybe there were and like on the enterprise the whole time. And that's all they were working on for the last four years. You know, I mean, he said people were working on it, but I mean, it could have been, but I mean, he could have been lying. We, we don't know because we never saw anything. Sure. Exactly. So anyways, um, that's, that was, uh, concerning for me. And the other thing I, I, 
mean, basically, I mean, when we see the Doctor from Voyager, and then we, and you know, obviously Moriarty in this, I mean, they are sentient people, but they are sentient only through the uh, Starship's, you know, computer files. Uh, I mean, the, the the computer processing on these ships. So, is an Enterprise, is a Voyager, and these big starships, are they actually capable of making uh, a sentient life? It, it appears that they are, but the the thing is, I mean, you know, sure, like the the crew of the Voyager had to accept, you know, that uh, the Doctor was real because that's that's all they had, and then he had a mobile emitter, and that made him even seem more real. And then he you know kept adding to his programming and you know <laughs> gave himself junk so he could procreate, and <laughs> he did all this weird stuff like he, really. he because you know more and more uh, uh, became a person, but. That's one of the biggest downfalls of Voyager to me is like we never got to see what happened to the Doctor when, when they got happened. Did he did he get stripped of his personhood? Like I, well, what what happened? Like could could Janeway and anyone have done anything to stop you know anything bad happening to the Doctor once they got home? Like well, we never last, got to see any of that explored. Well, we did. I mean, we did see a, a brief window in the very last episode. They have a party and. Uh, you know, the doctor's walking around and he's got a, I don't know if it was girlfriend or wife, but you know, he was just a man about town. So, you know, he did become somewhat of a person at that point. No, but like the last shot you see, I think I thought was just the ship flying over San Francisco. Well, yeah, but that was what, how, when Janeway got them back, this was the whole, I mean, it, I mean, the whole end, I mean, the last two parter of Voyager was, um, you know, a kind of a flashback of everything. Yeah. Oh, so, so. You, even before Janeway left. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, but that's, that's the thing. Like they, you know, that may, you know, that was years later, but I mean, the immediate fallout, you know, I mean, I guess he got his personhood back, but I mean, that timeline was canceled out when Janeway did what she did in game. So, I mean, mm-hmm. like, who knows, like, what would have happened if they got back on time? Because, I mean, the original Endgame, you know, she gets back. It takes them, like, 70 years to whatever to get back, even though she only takes eight. But whatever. It takes them 70 years to get back. And then she comes back in time so she can get them back quicker. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But so, I'm I mean, just, by, just... by, by that time, I mean, like, they probably had other other sentient holograms. So, it wasn't that big a thing. But since they, they got got him back, like, you know, 60 years early. Mm-hmm. Or sixty three years early, like maybe it would have been a completely different landscape. I mean, he would have been an anomaly. What would they have done to him? You know, it would have been completely different. And on top of that is, uh, you know, did they let Moriarty free, or is he still in that box? Who knows? Or did they, you know, did they like replicate the mobile emitter once he got back? Like it'd just be weird. Like all these different holograms running around. I just don't even understand how Voyager can cobble together a mobile emitter, but Data and Geordi can't figure that shit out with Barclay. Voyager did not cobble together a mobile emitter. They stole it from a guy who had technology from the 29th century. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <coughs> gotcha. All right. It was in that two-part episode with Sarah, Sarah Silverman. The guy crashed his ship, and the Bill Gates-type character from the 19th, uh, the 20th, or, the 19th or 20th century, um, like cobble, he made that with the... 29th century technology that mm. we found. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, Sarah Silverman that. was in two episodes of Star Trek Voyager. Just, we'll have to do that one soon, maybe. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, it brings up a lot of ethical things going on that, I mean, even the use of the holodeck uh, to bring up that that you could create a character and there wouldn't be any fail-safes on the thing to to stop it from creating sentient life. I mean... I just don't understand how nobody could figure out that there that would be part of the parameters. Well, it, it, it's it, it is a strange uh, you know dilemma and, and problem and like you know, but I mean the the ship, ship's main computer like I mean ship is that isn't even sentient. How can it create sentient life just by by be, being given a command, or does it have like a scan of data? Like was data more or less copied? Into the Moriarty character to make, right. you know, like was his like positronic brain like somehow scanned into the computer to make something equal? You know what I mean? Like, because I, I don't see how like the the non sentient Enterprise computer could create life on its own without having a template. You know what I mean? 
I don't get that either. I mean, it's it's. I mean, I understand they could probably write a program that's going to be uh, pretty advanced. To mimic sentience. Yeah, but is it sentient life? And I don't know. And the fact that they can, you know, that he could measure. I mean, he felt time pass and he was disembodied. Um, it just seems just off the wall to me that that's even a possibility. I mean, so that would mean that Moriarty was technically for the last four years floating around um, Enterprise's computers kind of, you know. Like a uh, ghost almost. Yeah, yeah, like a ghost. Very good. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I just I, – I, it seems like it's it's so latent with uh, with – with bad ethical decisions for, on Picard's side, which yeah. is unusual for Picard. Yeah, it really is unusual uh, that it would be something that Picard would do, and, and which is why they changed the ending to Elementary, My Dear Data. It just So it just makes me feel like they kind of went with the original ending of Elementary, My Dear Data to go with the opening for this episode, or you know how this episode closed anyway. Yeah. Because it, right. it does make everyone kind of seem like a dick. <laughs> but, I mean, like, it was the only way to save the ship, though. So, I mean, I mean, you kind of have to be a dick to a, like a hologram if you're going to kill a thousand people. I mean, we just did the episode with, you know, the Jim Adar. Right. And, you know, a thousand people died to save not even a captain and a bartender. And the bartender. I mean, I mean, and his kid, and and the nephew of the bartender. I mean, no, I, that's not a fair trade when you're talking about you know life. You know what I oh, mean? Absolutely, absolutely. A thousand yeah. people died to save two people. Yeah, like that's that's like really bad odds. The needs of the many exceed the needs <laughs> of the of the few or the one. Yeah, exactly. And this is the complete opposite. It's like what? Yeah. I don't know. So, uh, I mean, I'm not saying they shouldn't have been saved, but I mean, just saying, like, you know, it was the price was the price worth it? It just it was like, whoa, it doesn't seem right or fair, you know, ethically, you know. But they didn't know they were get kamikaze. But still, it's just like, whoa. I mean, that's partially what makes that scene even like more stand out. It's like, wow, right, right. They weren't even saving like an admiral or the president. It was just like a commander and a bartender. <laughs> No, it doesn't make a lot of sense, but I, for sure. Um, but so, yeah, I don't know. It's just it. it I, there's like it's the leap that uh, the logical leap that a ship could make a sentient life seems insane to me in in this in the Star Trek world. Um, I'm not saying it's not possible. It just seems hard to believe. And then the fact that Picard just kind of then just puts him in a box and says, "Eh, you know, live your life that way." asshole <laughs> <laughs> you know i don't know I, I just i can't i don't know it just seems weird to me it just it seems so unlike picard and so unlike star trek to leave the stories the way they are so yeah and we and we don't get we don't get moriarty back ever again ever again and you know we could have if you know the people in voyager and deep Space Nine didn't hate each other allegedly right uh, it's it is like interesting moral. It's just and, and then with the doctor too. It's just so such a weird thing. I mean, you know, we had the measure of a man episode for data, you know, you know, you know, assigning him personhood or not. But and I, th- I want to say Voyager had like a measure of a man esque episode for the doctor. I want to say they did something like that. I can't remember if they did or not, but I want to say they did. Mm-hmm. But I mean, does the rest of Starfleet adhere to that? Like it's. You know, it's just what, you know, what would happen? And, and like, you know, if they keep... And this is just the part of Star Trek we see. How many other sentient life forms are accidentally created on other starships in the Star Trek universe? Right. I mean, so, like, I mean, like, in, we, we've followed, like, what, three ships? You know, a couple different Enterprises, and then, you know, Voyager, and then, you know, Deep Space Nine. It's just... It's mind-blowing. The, the kind of things that they bring up. And that's, that's it's one of the great things about Star Trek. They bring up these really oddball things that make well, you think. And I mean, I mean, sooner or later, I, I can't imagine that we wouldn't come up with something that's going to resemble, if not be sentient with just our technology at some point. I mean, maybe it'll be 50 years from now, 100 years from now with our computers. But will we be in some kind of, you know, uh, video game? Uh, type of situation and 
the these video game programmers have actually programmed sentient life by accident you know especially with online gaming could there be like just some kind of character that's actually surviving bouncing around people's homes playing in those games you know i don't know I think I personally think we're a long, long way. I don't know if that's going to be in our lifetime. I mean, I mean, it could. Well, like be, I said, I, said I mean, 50, I, I, I mean, fifty to hundred years. I mean, I've looked at the you know the the you know, singularity graph and how like you know artificial intelligence is shooting up and up and up and up. As far as for video games go, because you know I, I do play my fair share of video games. Like artificial intelligence in games is bad. It's still really bad. Um, I'm just saying. I'm just saying that they're. I mean, I, I'm just making a. I'm not saying it's going to happen in video games, but like, what if it was? You know, and like, sure. I mean, because Holodeck is an extension of video games. I mean, I, I get what you're coming from, but I'm just saying, like, like just from personal experience in that world, like, game artificial intelligence isn't all that great. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and even even on games, where they try to make things super lifelike. It's just it's still like you know, things have like you know limited responses or limited number of actions. They don't really break out of like you know three yeah. or four different things they can do. But let's 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 stretch it out. Let's say fifty years from now, and you know we have now uh, virtual reality or or something to that nature, where we are actually immersed reality, uh, simulated reality, video games. You know that's a very strong possibility that that could be that we could be living in that life. I mean, fifty years from now, that's I mean that's I mean in in technological terms, that's like thousands of years because I mean, I mean we had you know thirty years ago we had you know Atari and. SNES, and you know, now we have, you know, near photorealistic looking things. I mean, so technology has evolved massively in thirty years. Yeah. So now that things are looking photo, you know, close to photorealistic, maybe in the next fifty, that's where artificial intelligence will start coming in. Skynet, we're doomed. Skynet. Yeah, but I guess my point being is like we we're obviously video games are always pushing the envelope of uh, tech and things like that. So. Sure. I'm not saying it's going to happen in video games. I'm just saying it, I could see something like that happening. Like what if they made a character that, you know, somehow became sentient through not just through the video game itself, but through the whole like you know internet of accessing information and yeah, you know, or what if the internet itself becomes one giant sentient brain, you know, at some, <laughs> you know, I you know I'd almost I almost kind of welcome a sentient internet. That way, it could tell us what news is fake and what news is not fake. <laughs> <laughs> or could it be lying to us and just having us drive into uh, giant blenders and, and, you know, turn us into just puree? It, you know? it, it could, but I mean, I don't know. I just, I mean, just the, it'd be nice to have something tell us what's real news and fake news. It's like, oh, the internet's like, no, I'm not going to show fake news today. Or maybe it'll only show fake news. No. Just to placate us. Oh, man, that would be bad. Everything's fine. I don't want this. I don't want the sentient internet. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, there's there's a lot of problems that could come with a sentient, a whole internet that becomes sentient. But but I, I think you know, I think we have so many doomsday movies and TV shows and video games about you know artificial intelligence getting smart and taking over. I would think that since it's something on our mind and our fiction, that you know, the people who are working on you know things in real life are you know putting you know countermeasures in place or you know i you know isaac isomov's you know robot laws of robotics into code or something i i would say so too but here's the thing um two things with that one um i don't think they're thinking about what if sentient life just evolved uh within like something outside of any kind of planning you know so what if it did happen I within if, i don't know if things can happen like that on accident I'm not saying it's going to, but I'm saying in a hundred years. What is it? Yeah. I mean. So then who knows? And secondly, I think we give people way too much credit. Every time I run into people who I think are going to be way smarter and think much more than me, and I'm not saying I'm a genius by any stretch of the imagination, there always seems to be like people like, oh, yeah, we didn't do that. Or no, we we thought about doing that, but we forgot to. You know, I'm like, what? How, you know, just, you know, I mean, obviously just look at our government today. I mean, you have. the year. 2000. Like yeah, we talked just about like, before the show last week, talking about Y2K stuff. Yeah, just it seems bizarre that these things aren't actually being handled correctly. I mean, there's all sorts of problems that come about, and you're like, because we, you know, we didn't have funding for this, so we didn't actually get around to it. You know, it's like what? 
So yeah, that's I, that's that's a fair point for sure. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just saying it makes me worried. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean I understand. I mean the thing is, I mean the way technology changes today from a couple of years ago. I mean, just it's hard to even guess what 50 years from now would look like. I was just thinking about uh, just today about you know around the year 2000 2001 time period and just tech tech from then and tech from now. It's like you can't even like it's not even comparable. You know, I mean, and we're only talking, you know, like 17, 16 years. I mean, I remember 1995 getting – my dad got a brand new computer, it was Compact Presario. It had 1.5 gigabytes of data and, you know, on the hard drive. And it's like you can never use that. It was yeah. It was inconceivable that you could ever fill up a gigabyte of data and now right. like i go through two gigabytes of data on my phone or more a month it's just just hell i mean it's insane rem- i mean like from a computer to your cellular data it's just insane and you know in 20 years just remember floppy disks going to yeah. uh you know you know uh jump drives or thumb drives you know i remember thumb drive having like uh what uh 516 uh, K or whatever it is, you know, was like huge because it's like half a gig, you know, it's like, Oh my God, there's so much memory. I can put so much in for now. You can have things that are like, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's mind, mind blowing. And it's in, in the next 20 years, it's going to be even crazier. So it, it is going to be crazier, but Moore's law has held constant for 20 something years now or, or longer. Uh, but I've been reading the different different tech sites and blogs and things that Moore's Law is actually starting to slow down because of mm-hmm. like things have to exist in real life and things you know uh, heat and and different things are it's it's hard to keep Moore's Law on track now because the transistors have gotten so small they're shrinking dyes and all yeah, the, they, all the all this stuff like at the at the point like it's hard to make things physically smaller you know what I mean and still have the same number of transistors. This is, this is where I this is where I think quantum computing is going to be the next thing. I, I I know it's still a stretch of the imagination, but I do think that if you can have instead of the idea of a circuit an on and off circuit, if you could have multiple uh, instead of on and off, up and down kind of like you know things like that, it's going to be completely I have different. A, I have a hard time wrapping my head around you know regular right. coding, which is you know just uses binary. I can't imagine coding. On like you know, on a trinary system, you know, on off and both. Yeah, that just that just hurts my head thinking about it. And, and I mean, quantum computers. I mean, I remember talking with my friends about quantum computers in like the nineties. I mean, it's it's been a thing people have been talking about for a while. But uh, also silicon. I was I listened to an article or saw something on on a YouTube channel that silicon is actually starting to, you know, um, not become as useful anymore. Just mm-hmm. because, just because, like you know, our technology is kind of outpaced silicon as far as you know, how computers are built, and there's going to be you know new and better materials to be able to conduct electricity and make things better and faster going forward to keep Moore's law going. If they're going to, it's not going to be done in silicon; it's going to be done something else. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Right, but my only point is, is that it's like I, I do think we're going to we're going to have to make a jump to a different a different way of computing. Period. You know, as sooner or later to to uh, increase everything. So, yeah, I, I I mean, quantum computing is absolutely fascinating. Um, I, we are definitely not there yet. No, at the, at this point in you know uh, 2017, we I, are not not even I, close. There. I just think it's bizarre that I remember talking with my friends about it in like the 90s or early 2000s. Like it's still like it's it was a concept that long ago, and it's still you know we don't even have any practical applications of it yet, as far as I'm aware. No, we're definitely not. And apparently there's a whole bunch of other reasons why it's not working too because there's a – I guess they have to make containment rooms for them because you know the other kind of subatomic prom, uh, particles can actually enter into the areas and they can fuck everything up I guess. That's what I've read about. So I mean it's it's really – crazy you know it's hard to even like i mean like it's it's hard to wrap my brain around it you know so well i mean one of the other things we're talking about and not just storage about the, i mean not just computing power but storage we're talking about you know encoding data onto dna oh sure yeah yeah like because you could st- store so much i mean because dna is what makes everyone 
up, you know, every little thing about them. So, I mean, like, if they can, you know, start storing regular data in DNA, that's just going to be crazy. Like, in a thing of 15 or 20 years, we've got, like, oh, I've got my DNA drive here. It holds, like, you know, 30,000 exabytes. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just, it, like... Yeah, there's definitely... It's so, hard to wrap your head around that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's... Uh, you know, and DNA computing, chemical computing. I mean, there's lots of different stuff that could be done as well. I mean, I'm not up on all this, but I'm sure there's some huge brainiac scientists working in some laboratories right now trying to figure all this shit out. But um, I don't know. I just I, I I'm not saying that we that it's it's impossible to. Uh, I'm not saying it is possible that there will be a sentient uh, life coming from technology, but if it does, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, like I could see it happening and maybe we wouldn't notice it right away. Sure. I mean, I know different people are really frightened about that. Like where computers are going to get away from us and, you know, how we, you know, people are saying we have to become cyborgs so we can like, you know, work as fast as the, the computers do, you know, in the future. <laughs> Like, you know, are we going to turn ourselves into the Borg? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and some people make the uh, the idea that the human form is actually more like the um, caterpillar form. And our next form will actually be uh, the butterfly form will be the, um, you know, us meshing with computers somehow. Oh, that's, so. that stinks because butterflies don't live very long. Once <laughs> That's like the shortest form of the life. Well, is that, you know is, that, is that when we blow, saying, blow ourselves up? Or maybe we uh, move on to the next plane of existence. Become a Q? Yeah, something well, to that nature. But it's interesting. Like, uh, you know the Fermi paradox? Mm-hmm. I, I saw a video that said one of the reasons for the Fermi paradox may be that, you know, technology, you know, people just, they just get to this technology. Instead of, like, branching out, they just end up destroying themselves, which is why... You know, the Fermi one of them, is one of the possible reasons why the Fermi paradox is a thing. Like once they reach our level and then they start going above, they just end up destroying themselves. And that's like, oh man, that's depressing. <laughs> right? Yeah. There's like certain uh, what do they call it? Uh, are they gates or uh, gateways uh, where they um, that you can hit that you might not actually get through those. Uh, I forgot what they called. They're not called gateways. There's something to that nature, but the, it's like, idea like, like eras of, of existence or whatever. Yeah, like basically, like there's disease, nuclear war, all sorts of things like to that nature that that we could that we could come across. And if you know, famine or gamma. Uh, another one was like gamma ray bursts because gamma ray bursts can be like hundreds of light years across, and gamma ray bursts are just crazy deadly. They're just like a like shot in the dark. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they can fry life from ridiculously far, you know, away. It's just like, you know, we could all be dead tomorrow from a, you know, a gamma ray burst so we wouldn't know. Or a really alternate Incredible Hulk. A world planet Hulk is here, folks. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> or all the, planet, the, the, the planet would be completely pulverized and we're all punching <laughs> each other. <laughs> We can't stop it. No, but um, yeah, lots of there's. It's interesting, like just listening to theories about why the Fermi paradox is is what it is. Yeah. It's it's depressing too. It's like oh, oh, didn't make it. Well, um, we've gone a long way from Professor Moriarty. We uh, have, to, but it's just it just bought the me. Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk. Yeah, <laughs> just artificial intelligence in general. It spawns just interesting things, and the holodeck. Holodeck episodes are always fun, and I don't know if they were always as thought-provoking as this one, but this one was definitely one of the more thought-provoking ones, I, think, I believe. Yeah, sometimes they're just fun, funny romps, but uh, yeah, this is definitely um, this it's thought-provoking, but also um, just really, especially Ship in the Bottle is just a uh, really well-written story and and you know well put together. Very well written. I was reading the Memory Alpha, and they were saying like the production crew. Like we're writing their own notes to figure out what was happening because of like the world within a world within a world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like we, you were saying when they were which, making it, they were confused, which is which is funny. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And the guy who wrote this, I mean, he's uh, one of these guys that uh, we've talked about before, um, uh, Rene uh, Ashivara, and he, you know, he's written The Offspring, Iborg, True Q. 
um, tons of, you know, uh, uh, trials and tribulations, um, uh, tons of good. I mean, just a huge amount of writing credits behind him. So really great episodes. Yeah, I mean, there's he's got a ton, so he's a he's a well he's a good a good writer. So and speaking of the offspring, we should be talking about that next week with Michelle Speck if all goes to plan. If if we still don't have the disease, <laughs> the disease. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's a good episode. I I highly recommend, especially if you have the moment, you know, like if you have like a little more than an hour, you know, um, an hour and. 30 some minutes because i think they're both like 40, 40 minutes long like 40 45 minutes long yeah yeah if you can watch uh, elementary my dear data and uh, a ship in a bottle i mean watch them back to back it's really fun it's really fun watching them back to back uh i mean they're great episodes individually and watching them with their seasons they're both you know decent really good points in the seasons but watching them back to back was just so good I, it just there's something about it it just it, it really was like a, a perfect two-parter that wasn't, you know, it was four seasons apart. And, and I don't think it was thought of as a two-parter, uh, more of a callback. But when you put them back to, I mean, back to back and watch them as like part one, part two, it's just awesome. So, yeah, definitely do that. Yeah, go ahead and give that a look, guys. Um, it's a lot of fun, you know, and then maybe you can speak with your Star Trek friends or mention us. And, you know, if you've got any other kind of conspiracy theory or... You know, technology is going to destroy us all, or you know, what do you think is going to happen in the future? You can always email us at synthaholics at yahoo.com or you know, message us on the group, the facebook.com slash group slash synthaholics. Yeah, let us know what you think Moriarty is doing with Regina right now. Oh, they're diddling. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. They just uh, blew up a big mattress in the back of that shuttlecraft. And... Man, I think of all the fun you could be having just, just flying through the universe. You know, I don't know, shuttlecraft running across some Ferengi or Klingons or Borg, and they're just gonna mess up your day. Yeah, I wonder if the Borg were programmed into that computer cube. That'd be funny. Yeah. Actually, you know, you think about <laughs> you think about uh, Moriarty doing that. I mean, he could be sort of like uh, the Doctor Who, you know, running around the universe causing havoc that in the be, Star Trek universe. That would be interesting. Yeah, but kind of more of an evil Doctor Who, of course, but... Uh, I mean, they could have done, like, a whole bottle episode of just, like, his at Crazy Adventures. They not even show the Enterprise crew. Yeah, it would be really <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Him and Regina but, running around, causing havoc. Come on, Regina. Oh, man, like, I, I just, I really want to see them go to Ryza. Because, like, you know, they're they're, like, you know, 18th century British sensibilities and, like going on a planet where everyone's screwing each other and then like the the people who work on the planet are also hey. there to screw you hey regina wore <laughs> slacks at one point and she loved it so oh, she loved yeah she did love uh those slacks on the african safari she it's hard to get back to a corset she did not want to go back to wearing a corset oh i can't blame her no i can't either but yeah so definitely let us know what you think uh what you think of uh the whole dilemma of this and what do you think moriarty's doing with regina um and on top of that, if uh, you get a chance, um, oh, and if you do, if you have, it, other than an email, you could also just do a voice message uh, or and send it to us by sending a, a recording uh, audio clip and sending it to our synthaholics at yahoo.com um, email address. We'd love to play that on the uh, episode as well. And that way we can respond to it and, uh, you know, voice voice our opinions to, to your opinion. We, we had a lot of fun doing that with our 100th episode. We'd love to get more of those and do those, you know, sporadically during the year. Absolutely. So, yeah. Oh, um, you can follow me on social media at David underscore J underscore Duncan. Uh, all our music is provided by Warp 11, uh, except for the beginning. That's provided by who? Dave Wilkes. Dave Wilkes. He's got my name. I should remember that. Um, they're in, and they're in music is by Warp 11. You can find them at warp11.com or warp11 on Twitter. Uh, the shows at Synthaholic Duo on Twitter. Uh, Guy Davis is at GS Davis Art on Twitter. I'm at Black Blue, Black Blackbird 2004. Yeah, I misspelled it that way once. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, rate us on iTunes. We need those stars and we need those reviews so we can be seen in that old, ye old artificial intelligence iTunes algorithm. Every podcast you listen to says the same thing, and it's said for a very good reason. It is absolutely important uh, for us. It's huge. It's yeah. Take five minutes. Give us five stars. 
write a review you know let people know um and if you have a couple bucks to uh throw our way we appreciate it you could go to patreon at uh, uh patreon forward slash syntaholics and uh you know give us a buck if you can just to help us pay for our cost of you know giving you this free podcast yeah we're running the show we got the you know monthly cost with the web hosting and the yearly cost with the uh you know website and you know anything extra will help us get out to you know cons and everything so we can interact with you guys uh, in person hopefully because we love meeting people we love going to conventions and and talking star trek with people it's a lot of fun and if you heard our episode a couple episodes ago you got to hear a little bit of that uh, from our local con here yeah and we appreciate it and it would be extremely helpful if you know people who love Star Trek, love podcasts. Let them know about the episode, our show, Since the Holics. Tell them that we talk about Professor Moriarty and his uh, companion Regina flying through the universe. Uh, people want to know these things. People want to hear these things. I want to hear about these things. And, and our inane babblings about artificial intelligence. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> who doesn't? So yeah, let people know about Since the Holics. Let them, you know, say hey. There's this great podcast, Synthaholics, to talk about Star Trek, talk about Regina. They make Have us laugh. Listen. They even podcast when they're sick. I mean, they're they're just good, good all around guys. Oh, we're the best guys. The best guys. The best. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for listening. Thank you for being here, supporting the show. Uh, live long and prosper, one and all. We'll see you next week, and hopefully, it'll be awesome. You can sing and we'll cry to it. Bullshit our pants You're the best drinking friend I ever had Regina Reginio, Reginio Wherefore art thou, Reginio? Reginio <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's so much Regina jokes Oh, we said Regina a couple times <laughs> We should have a game. How many times Regina was said? <laughs> That's the drinking game. Every time I set the holics say Regina, take a drink. Re- Regina. He's good at the musics. <laughs> Count Basie. <laughs> Count Basie. Count Basie's Basie. orchestra. Count Basie's. <laughs> yeah, he's good at the musics. <laughs> um, I'm How you still, feeling? I'm still sick. It's weird. Like I feel like shit in the morning, and then as the day goes on, I feel... Less and less crappy. Yeah, still, it's, uh, that's kind of what I've had. Still like sniffling and coughing though. Just yeah. that, just that I had a fever earlier, so took some mocha and got that down. Did you, did you have dribble dick? No, I, I didn't have that. <laughs> because that's a sure sign of Ebola. Oh, oh. <laughs> I didn't know that. 